Well, should we get started, do you think? All right, we've got uh, a good group. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, today is our session on the Healthy Brain Initiative, the Roadmap for Indian Country. My name is Edie Yao. I'm the Director of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, um, Engagement. And uh, I'm joined by Tommy Hernandez, who is the Public Policy Director uh, for the New Mexico chapter. So thank you for joining us today. We will both be speaking um, and we hope to have some time for some conversation and discussion uh, afterwards. So with that, uh, Tommy, should we go ahead and pull up our slides? That sounds fantastic. Thank you so much for the introduction, uh, Edie. Let's go ahead and get this, uh, get this conversation started. Very much look forward to sharing a lot of valuable information here today. So give me one moment while I share my screen. We'll go ahead and begin just momentarily. Perfect. Um, so uh, let's see. Let me put some context around this. Uh, there is another session right now, uh, I believe, or maybe following following this session that talks a little bit more in depth about uh, the companion, or this is actually the companion piece, this roadmap for Indian country, um, which is designed to really tailor the work that we're trying to accomplish here in terms of educating tribal communities um, and really taking the strengths uh, within Indian country uh, with a public health approach to cognitive health. Um, so we're really excited about this. It's worth noting that this is the first um, document and, and plan designed to talk about dementia specifically for American Indians and Alaska Natives. Um, and so I'll share some stats in a little bit, but uh, really excited about this piece. And so the purpose of it is really to think about how can we initiate conversations within communities um, and again, bringing in the strengths um, and partnering with tribal communities. But first of all, let's talk a little bit about dementia. Dementia is uh, this umbrella term, as you see, which is uh, why we have this image of an umbrella. And there are many types of dementia, um, Alzheimer's being the number one cause of dementia. And dementia is really that term used for um, describing symptoms related to cognitive decline or memory loss. So whenever someone is concerned um, that they do, is it just daily uh, forgetfulness? Is it due to aging or is it something more serious? Dementia often re um, impairs one's ability to function on a daily basis. And so um, that's an important um, distinction. But you can see that there are other types of dementia as well. And so it's almost like saying, someone has, um, for example, cancer. There are many different types of cancer and there are many different causes and types of dementia. Um, and there's also a mixed dementia, which means that a person can have more than one kind of dementia. So they could have Alzheimer's and vascular, for example. Um, next slide. So, why are we talking about this? Well, dementia is in fact um, quite prevalent among older adults um, and one in 10 individuals in the United States over the age of 65 have Alzheimer's and one in three American Indian or Alaska natives uh, have over 65 also are impacted by dementia, including Alzheimer's disease. The population of older American Indians and Alaska Natives uh, is growing. Um, and between 2014 to 2060, it's hard to imagine projecting that far out, but the number of American Indians and Alaska Natives aged 65 and older uh, living with dementia is projected to grow over five times. 
Now, we were just talking with our partners uh, at National Indian Council on Aging, and we were talking about how many tribes determine um, how they define older adult, and it might be a younger age. Um, and I think one of the things that we were discussing is the fact that people are living longer, and that's a that's a positive thing. Longevity is uh, uh, um, is an indicator of of good health. At the same time, we know that age is a major risk factor for dementia, and so this is why we might start to see dementia more. Um, but with that, we want to be able to help multi generations deal with dementia and be able to uh, identify the symptoms earlier. Um, because oftentimes a person with dementia, it's not just a singular disease, it really affects entire families, uh, cross generations, and entire communities, in fact. Next slide. So let me turn this over to Tommy to talk about some more specific statistics. Yeah, thank you so much, Edie. And, and I want to just quickly circle back to the previous slide for our, um, for our audience today. Now, we know that uh, certain ethnic groups are more affected, uh, more likely rather to develop Alzheimer's disease or, or other forms of dementia, um, as, as we saw in the, st in the statistics previously presented. But this is particularly a concern for New Mexico, because we know that here in New Mexico, we have 23 federally recognized tribes or pueblos. Um, and so this raises a lot of concern and it certainly puts a lot of, uh, you know, a, a strong set of responsibility on the New Mexico chapter to introduce the Healthy Brain Initiative and, and its very robust set of tools, its guidelines to our tribal leaders to explain to them how the Healthy Brain Initiative can help them prepare their communities, improve their communities, for uh, you know, the, the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease that we certainly project will grow here in our state. So I think it's important to provide just a little more of a deeper dive into why the Healthy Brain Initiative Roadmap for Indian Country is a particular interest for our state and much of the, the Southwest and the other frontier states that have very large populations of American Indian uh, communities. So with that said, let's go and jump right into the New Mexico specific statistics. Now, before I jump right into all the data, I wanna explain a little bit how we arrive at this data. So every year, the New Mexico chapter, along with other chapters in the other states, uh, we seek a placement um, in a statewide survey that is known as the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System. Now, this is a statewide telephonically, uh, scientifically conducted survey that allows us to get the data on how the disease is impacting New Mexico. Uh, and we're gonna jump right into those statistics very soon. But I thought it was important to share how we get this data. And that is done through these telephonic surveys that are statewide and they are run by the epidemiology division of the New Mexico uh, Department of Health. So now that you know how we got this data, let's go and talk about the data. So uh, what you see here is a whole lot of numbers, right? But I'm gonna go and focus on three bullet points. And the first and foremost is that New Mexico is projected to have one of the largest increases in disease prevalence. And when I say that, we're talking about comparison of all of the states. And the reason why that is, is because a lot of the information we've already heard today is that Hispanics are more likely to develop the disease. Uh, American Indians are more likely to develop Alzheimer's or other forms of dementia as well. And then we also know that compounding on top of those two things is that New Mexico is gonna have one of the largest populations of people age 65 and older uh, by 2025. So just in a few short years, New Mexico is gonna be presented with some very strong challenges. So that's why implementing tool sets like the Healthy Brain Initiative uh, with our tribal leaders, with our public officials, with our relevant uh, health agencies is key and absolutely critical today now more than ever just to prepare our state with the infrastructure that is needed and the practices that are also demanded uh, to prepare for this, for this very large spike in the disease. So moving along to the second bullet point, we have a 23% increase uh, from 2022 to 2025 of the overall uh, you know, prevalence of Alzheimer's disease and the fifth highest average number of hours per, uh, per week by caregiver. 
this was one of my one particular bullet point I wanted to share because we're obviously gathered here today for the annual caregivers conference. And you heard Edie explain just a few slides back that caregivers are affected just as severely as those who are living with the disease. So with New Mexico being one of the states with the highest projected uh, you know, increases of the disease and, and what we know about the Healthy Brain Initiative and all of its tool sets, uh, that's why we feel that today's presentation is particularly important to the many of you who are on this call um, and are in positions to help us with implementing this roadmap throughout the state. Would you like to add anything to this, uh, to the information I've shared, Edie, on this slide? No, I think that's fantastic. I think you provided some good context um, in terms of some data and where that data comes from. I think that's really important to share. Great, let's go in advance to the next slide. So I, I believe you may have heard Dr. Hill talk a little bit about our facts and figures report and the um, uh, additional special report, race, ethnicity, and Alzheimer's in America. I just want to highlight again how um, significant some of this uh, data is because it is the first time that uh, the Alzheimer's Association included Native Americans um, in the survey to gather the perspective um, and attitudes uh, related to Alzheimer's and dementia. And so one of the things that came out of this was that in fact, discrimination is a barrier to quality Alzheimer's and dementia care. It's also worth noting that one of the things we asked about is the knowledge and stigma um, about Alzheimer's. And you can see that 25% of Native Americans or American Indians, um, you know, ha had a, a concern about Alzheimer's. Um, and then certainly, many individuals um, may feel uh, reluctant to participate in clinical trials or research. At the same time, it's so important that we have representation and the reflection of all of our communities when we're looking at ways to reduce um, uh, the stigma, but also finding a treatment for Alzheimer's disease and other dementia. Um, so, the fact that discrimination is in fact highlighted as one of the things that is a barrier, I think that really highlights the importance of this roadmap and how this roadmap is really taking an approach that partners with communities, partners with um, tribes and nations, the leaders of tribes and nations to develop an approach that um, enhances and really draws upon the traditions uh, within communities. Next slide. So you, um, Tommy, I suppose at some point we wanna direct people to, we'll probably do that at the end, but direct people where they can actually find the full text of the Healthy Brain Initiative, um, the roadmap. Um, but, you know, again, this is really highlighting some of the importance of this. So the question here might be, well, so, so this is a concern. What is it that tribal leaders and uh, uh, leaders in general um, in communities, how can they help? You know, what is it that we can do to promote wellness among our elders and among communities uh, affected by dementia? And so this is really trying to provide some of those guiding steps and how how do you go about starting this conversation and what are some of the key strategies? Next slide. Absolutely. Yes, were you gonna say something, Tommy? Yeah, I'm just going to add something uh, to, to that previous slide. I'll go in a, just circle back once. And just to add to what Edie had mentioned is that the executive summary here, um, first off, the executive summary provides a little bit just of an oversight. And you're seeing that to the left of your screen. To the right, you're seeing the full text of 34 pages. Earlier, you, had, you heard me say that it is a very robust set of guidelines, of, of practices to be implemented. But one thing I'd like to add is, is in a, among the 34 pages, right, among this, is that who is this content really intended for? And it really is intended for tribal leaders, for community leaders, um, for public health officials to take this executive summary along with the full text 
and really understand how they can use the strategies laid out in the HBI, the Healthy Brain Initiative, um, to improve how they are tackling Alzheimer's and dementia for their caregivers, for those who are living with the disease, and uh, sadly, those who may, who may uh, also develop the disease. Uh, just to give a quick run through of what that executive summary uh, kind of captures and what it presents is basically the strategies sound like this. Educate and empower community members. We need to collect and use data, which I referred to earlier when we talked about the statistics, uh, and then strengthening the workforce as well. So among those three, there are eight specific strategies. So I thought that was just a, you know, a, a, something to add to what you had mentioned uh, earlier, Edie, and I think that'll help our audience kind of get a little bit more of an idea of what the HBI intends to do and who it is intended for as well. I'll go ahead and move to the next slide and we can go and begin or continue rather. Yeah, and I think this is, um, so I think you've kind of summarized what we're gonna cover. <laughs> um, so it is a conversation starter um, and again, prompting local public health um, leaders and officials into having this conversation. Um, I am not sure what else to add to this slide. <laughs> given what you had shared. I don't know if you want to share some more about this one. Well, I'd like to go and focus a little bit on that conversation starter because this, I want to go and share with our uh, with our group today that this is such an important step in implementing the, the uh, Healthy Brain Initiative Roadmap because um, what we have found in implementing this roadmap here in New Mexico is that the conversation is, is not necessarily as easy uh, in these particular communities, in our, in our American Indian communities, as other communities. And the reason why is because they have long been underserved, underrepresented, and, and frankly, ha have really had very little interaction um, with organizations like ours. So the conversation starter um, certainly was a very, uh, a very careful, a very culturally appropriate um, approach that we started in the initiative. And, you know, thanks to, you know, a, a lot of our understanding, uh, you know, led by the association on how to, you know, begin to, to bring the HBI roadmap uh, for Indian country to our tribal leaders. Um, we use a very culturally appropriate, uh, you know, approach here. Uh, we recognize that the conversation is not a one size fits all. And, and we feel that, that that really speaks to a lot of the success we've had, Edie, here in, in our chapter. And I know that you've obviously helped uh, my fellow public policy directors and program staff in other chapters as well. But that conversation starter is, is such a key step um, in advancing the roadmap for Indian country. So before we could even get to the strategies, having that conversation in a very culturally appropriate method, um, again, just could not be underscored anymore. So I just wanted to add that. And is there, if there's nothing else that you'd like to add? We can go ahead. Well, that. I think that's a really good point. And, and honestly, Tommy, I think you have more experience with this than I do in terms of, uh, you know, the implementation of this. This is a document that is doesn't do us any good if it's not actually implemented. So maybe we're gonna we're 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 winging this, right? Mm -hmm. um, so. You talked about how critical that conversation starter is, and I wonder, are there key people that you get in the room from your experience, and you know, key people that you need to have in the room to have that conversation and to be culturally relevant and all of that? You know, that's that's a, that's a really great question, Edie, and I'm really happy to share that with our group today because uh, it's not just as easy as finding a tribal leader. It is it really is identifying who the elders are, um, who are members of influence of these communities. Because one thing we have learned here from our work in New Mexico is that while many of these tribes and these, you know, these Pueblo communities are, are quite sovereign and they do have their own government structure, it is equally as important to not only engage with them, but to engage with the community elders. We know that the elders of these communities um, are, are, are so valued, they're, they're, they're just, you know, monuments uh, in themselves uh, of their community. So engaging these community members is equally as important as engaging, uh, you know, the public health officials who work on these, you know, work in these communities. And while, while we're talking about the conversation, I want to go ahead and add something else too, is that 
in here in New Mexico with the 23 federally recognized tribes and pueblos, nearly every one of them has its own unique language. And some of those languages do not have a word specific for Alzheimer's or dementia. Um, they recognize, you know, memory loss, uh, forgetfulness, many of the other words that are obviously related symptoms of Alzheimer's disease and other dementia. But speaking specifically about, you know, the, the, the scientific, the medical term of dementia using Alzheimer's or, or any of the other forms of it, a lot of these, a lot of these communities, a lot of their, you know, their, their native languages don't have a word for that. And so sometimes it can be difficult to have conversations about a disease that there is no word for. Um, so when we talk about, you know, having a conversation, um, it really is a whole new type of conversation. Um, and that needs to be, that needs to be, uh, you know, carefully thought of before engaging with our, you know, with our public health leaders, with our elders in these communities, um, simply because it, it should not be, it should not be expected that you, any one person can go, you know, begin a meeting with one of these tribal leaders and begin speaking about Alzheimer's disease when uh, there is simply no word for Alzheimer's disease in their language. So when we mm -hmm. talk about culturally appropriate and culturally sensitive, that is one of the many things that we mean by that. So I hope mm -hmm. that that helps our listeners today understand um, just how careful this work needs to be, uh, mm -hmm. needs to be uh, taken up. That's a really, that's a terrific point. Yeah, next slide. I, yes. that, I think that really talks about that knowledge and awareness piece, right? Um, so even before we talk about here's the roadmap and here's why this is important, getting some context of how, how do people talk about these symptoms in the community and what words do they use and what's the concept behind it? Um, because for many, they may view this is just normal or so what if they have dementia? Uh, what are we, we're not going to abandon them because they have dementia. And so I think really getting that understanding. Um, and I like your point that it's not just uh, officials, but really community leaders, the elders are important uh, individuals to include. So as Tommy had pointed out earlier, the eight strategies are kind of bundled into three different categories. Um, and one of them is in fact, knowledge and awareness that this was the rising area of importance in terms of the strategy. So to Tommy's point, again, how do you start that conversation? at the most fundamental level of, you know, what, what are you seeing? How do we talk about it? The language we use, the, the terminology or whatnot. Um, and, and understanding if there's even a, a concern. Um, so the Alzheimer's Association certainly has uh, materials that can be shared. The CDC, this has been a partnership among so many organizations Alzheimer's Association, CDC, um, International Association on uh, um, Indigenous Aging has also been a partner, a collaborative on developing this roadmap, uh, Indian Health, Health Centers um, and the National uh, Indian Health Board as well. So you can see that a, a number of different organizations have come together to think about this. Um, the other, so the other thing here in terms of knowledge and awareness is so working with community members to understand brain health. Um, also the benefits of early detection and diagnosis, um, even, even if one views this as no different from how they would care for the person otherwise, uh, there are some benefits for early detection and diagnosis. And so helping community members understand why that is. The second piece of this is really providing community members some effective strategies. Um, while uh, forgetfulness may be something that we embrace, um, we can help families understand um, how to manage communication more effectively so that they avert some of the dementia behaviors. Um, and supporting, again, the caregivers is a, is a critical piece. Uh, caregivers 
meaning anyone who provides care for someone with dementia. So it does not have to be that primary singular person that provides that care, but it's the whole community. Maybe it's um, the people who are, uh, you know, working, um, providing um, the nutritious foods or whatnot, um, but it's the whole community, anyone who's providing care for someone with dementia. So thinking about how, what are strategies to um, help them as well. Yeah, that's, that's a really great point, Edie. And, you know, I'd like to add here um, to what you're saying is that uh, here in New Mexico, what we have found a lot of success in our approach is when we engage, when I engage, when our program director engages uh, with these elders, with these tribal leaders, uh, with these public health officials, and, and we begin the conversation uh, on what the roadmap is and what it intends to do and how it can help these communities and their aging populations. But one thing, one takeaway I want to leave with the group today is that we really focus on two things. Uh, uh, one is explaining how we can help from as an external partner, but more importantly, is not just the help that is promised to these communities from organizations like ours and from, for example, state government agencies, but also how they can build sustainable models from within. A lot of these communities are, you know, they, they are very special communities. Um, they, they, they really hold on to community in a very, in a very unique way that, that is, is certainly, um, Unlike other, you know, other, uh, you know, subpopulation groups that, that I've been able to work with. And so with that said, it's not just how can external partners from these communities help, um, but also how can we help them build an infrastructure from within that is going to help these tribal leaders communicate the message of healthy aging of the importance, as you mentioned, Edie, of early detection diagnosis, recognizing those early signs and symptoms. And then when we talk about the healthcare system that is, you know, that, that is currently built within these communities, uh, making sure that we are reaching out to uh, these, these clinical you know, professionals and, and helping them understand the need to use the tools uh, for early detection diagnosis. And then also the, the simple fact that the prevalence is greater among our American Indian um, communities here across the country and here in New Mexico as well. So when we talk about knowledge and awareness um, here, here in New Mexico, we're doing it in, in a two prong form and fashion is one as external partners continue to help uh, by providing them you know, knowledge, expertise, guidance, but then also showing them how they can build internal support systems that will remain sustainable uh, throughout the years to come. So I hope that adds a little bit more to everything you said for our listeners today, Edie. Mm -hmm. Next slide, right. please. So again, I think to your point, right, it's, a, it's bringing together um, uh, sustainable models and having tribes initiate some of some of these best practices and what's worked well historically uh, in communities. Um, so this is the other second theme around uh, the roadmap for Indian country. Uh, I think the other thing I would mention here in terms of resources must be tailored to each tribe. One of the things um, as part of this process is really is doing focus groups, listening sessions to get a sense from uh, tribal leaders, community members in terms of what, what messages resonate. So for example, asking um, in these listening sessions, what, what does brain health mean to you? Um, and also what types of materials resonate well in terms of effective delivery of, of key messages. So these were some listening sessions that were done at the recent uh, Nas National Indian Council for Aging um, conference uh, by IA Squared. Um, and so th those are really helpful for us to understand better and incorporate um, the key messages and ways that make sense within communities. Next slide. Um, so again, these are the three buckets that we've identified the eight strategies to um, uh, categorize them in. Next slide. 
So we started talking about all of this already. I think we are kind of just jumping around in terms of having this conversation, but I think the conversation is probably more important than the order of the slides. Um, but I think anything to add to this is really, um, I, I wanna just highlight the helping families plan for the future. Um, I think COVID, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has really highlighted the importance of uh, protecting um, the survival of tribal elders, community elders, um, and, and thinking about the longevity of communities um, and keeping those traditions alive. Alzheimer's disease can last anywhere between two to 20 years, average of eight years. So when you think about as communities start to see dementia more in their families, among, among community members, um, what are the ways in which we can really um, leverage traditions and values to support people living within communities as long as possible and helping families be able to care for their uh, uh, family members, community members, as long as possible in ways that make sense. Um, that's just a really critical piece. Um, and so the more knowledge people have about what's coming, uh, the more they can prepare and to plan and think about all the people that need to be in place. Um, it, it's, it's, often, it's often unfortunate that people wait till the very end to get help when there's a crisis. I've seen this many times where families don't reach out until there's a crisis. And what we're trying to avert is, is that crisis. And so the more we can plan in advance um, and really build uh, communities that are supportive of individuals with dementia, the better off we can be. Next slide. This one, I, I think, Tommy, you might have a little bit more to say about this in terms of collecting and using data, but this is an important piece that uh, while we're building that infrastructure around the knowledge um, and the planning, uh, do you want to talk a little bit more about how we can use data and why this is important? Yeah, absolutely, Edie. So the Alzheimer's Association is the way I describe a lot of our strategies and, and how we arrive at these strategies is everything that we do is really based in science and that and collecting data is no exception for that. So a lot of our strategies are data driven. And you heard me talk a few slides earlier in the presentation about how we go about collecting this data. And that is done through the telephonic survey, the behavioral risk factor surveillance system. Um, that we are happy to report that every time the Alzheimer's Association has made its pitch, its presentation to the Department of Health, uh, we were pleased to receive um, the, uh, to be, have been selected rather, uh, for our questions to be included in that statewide survey. So what are those questions? Well, there's two modules and they are not run in the same year. They are alternated, they are rotated every other year. One of them is the cognitive decline uh, module. And those questions obviously relate to uh, cognitive decline, memory loss, um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, other issues that relate to, uh, you know, Alzheimer's or, or other symptoms of dementia. So we have the cognitive decline uh, module that is included at the end of this uh, statewide telephonic survey. The other module that we ask to be included is the caregiver module. And that allows us to collect information on how many caregivers there are approximately in the state who you know, identify as caregivers and you know for what conditions are they a caregiver you know is it someone with with the diagnosis of alzheimer's disease or other form of dementia so all of this data that we are able to collect um, allows us uh, empowers us to to really present data-driven decisions identify what issues are emerging and of course uh, begin to implement mitigating strategies and, and pre preventive uh, lifestyles um, such as healthy aging. So this data is, is extremely important in these conversations that we have 
um, not only with our tribal leaders, but uh, you know, in our Hispanic communities as well, um, who are also more likely uh, to develop the disease. So collecting data is absolutely critical, but I, I will also say, while we've had a lot of success in being included in this statewide survey um, that has empowered us with this, with this you know, very great data, there's still a lot of work to be done. And what I mean by that is we would like to see data specifically collected on our Native American uh, communities here in the state. So we hope in the coming years to find methods, to find avenues, to collect data that is specific to these communities so we can get a deeper understanding of the needs of, of the, the current successes that are you know, underway and the positive outcomes that those, that those initiatives are bringing. Um, and then also what other trends we should anticipate. Um, you heard me mention also earlier that there are many unique tribes. Uh, we have total of the 23 and each one of them may have some common challenges and each of them may have some very unique challenges. And only through data can we better understand how we go about our work uh, with, uh, with uh, you know, addressing Alzheimer's disease in these underserved um, and very specific communities. So I hope that provides a little bit more on how we collect and use data and why it's so important in, in our work and, and what more remains to be done to improve how data collection um, is, you know, is done and what, how it's used. Yeah, and I think your point about how important it is to get data that is specific to American Indians is something I, I would highlight because we don't have very much information and data about American Indians with dementia and caregiving. And this is really important. It's uh, otherwise we have no sense of the trends, but also um, what might be unique. Um, but that representation, again, is highly critical. Next slide. So this is the third uh, category, if you will, in terms of the strategies that are mapped out in the roadmap. Um, and this is about strengthening the workforce. This is uh, a huge issue uh, in the long-term care industry for sure. Um, but in particular, when we're talking about uh, dealing with dementia, this is an area that, that we think is, is worth uh, highlighting as well. So what we mean by this is educating healthcare and aging services professionals um, in Indian country, but also I think it's also important outside of Indian country um, in how to best deliver culturally appropriate, culturally sensitive care uh, for American Indians. Um, but but that first piece is really educating the providers about the signs and symptoms of dementia and about caregiving. I can tell you so many times when uh, a family is thinking about hiring a caregiver or seeking help outside of the family and when the person that they're hiring doesn't know anything about dementia, how challenging that is. So I'll give you a concrete example. Um, you, you need to go to work and you cannot leave your person with dementia at home alone. And if the person that you're hiring to care for that individual doesn't realize that you cannot leave the person alone because they may wander off and they may not recognize how to get home, uh, that's a real danger. That is a concrete example. And so expecting families to have to educate all the people outside of their home uh, about dementia and what are, the, what are the things that they should be aware of, what are the things that they, and how best to communicate with the person um, is a real burden. Um, and so that's something that we wanna highlight in terms of uh, educating the, the providers. The other piece is educating healthcare and aging service uh, professionals, again, on the best ways to support families and caregivers. So thinking about policy, thinking about some systemic uh, infrastructure, uh, things that can be incorporated to support people with dementia and their caregivers. Anything you wanna to add to this, Tommy? 
I think you, you covered this this um, this particular category of the overall uh, roadmap quite well. Um, I will add something very, very minor, though, is that um, when I think back to several of uh, you know a, a lot of the interactions and engagements I've had uh, in our in our uh, tribal communities, um, specifically speaking about the engagements I've had with healthcare professionals and healthcare systems, um, one statistic that always seems to really raise the level of attention is, is not that Alzheimer's disease is obviously growing nationally, but one statistic that always seems to elevate the interest uh, to, to implement the roadmap, ED, is, is when I say that American Indians are more likely than other ethnic groups to develop Alzheimer's disease, yet they are they are certainly overlooked when it comes to promoting brain health, to promoting healthy aging, um, among other lifestyles, right? That, that, that help reduce uh, the risk of developing the disease. So when I share why this is so important uh, to tackle Alzheimer's disease and dementia in these communities and to do it in a very culturally appropriate way, um, it always seems to elevate the attention and the concern when we express that our data shows that these communities, these particular population groups are more likely uh, than others to develop the disease, yet they lack the infrastructure, they lack the public awareness, the overall understanding. And, and, and even you know, back to what I had said earlier in our presentation about uh, they're not even being a word for Alzheimer's or dementia, right? So, so to get this strengthening the workforce in, in all of the, the robust way that the roadmap lays out is, is so important because while we work to bring this education at a public awareness level, uh, we also need to make sure that, that this, this awareness is being introduced in, the, in the, uh, the conversations with the doctor and their patients you know, in, their, in their rooms, in the hospitals, in these clinics. So I, I think this is a, a very particular important slide, and I think you covered it quite well. And I hope that kind of just adds a little bit more about how we're doing that here, here home in New Mexico. So that's great. Yeah, and I'm realizing we are getting short on time. Um, we, we managed to fill it up quickly. Uh, we wanted to share a couple examples. I'm just going to gloss over this quickly because I want Tommy to share more specific to New Mexico. Uh, but the Pyramid Lake Paiute tribe, they created a dementia capable community. So working with another organization to really build in that knowledge about dementia and having those folks who now uh, have that training share out um, to others about dementia is an effective approach to building the public awareness. Um, and then they also hosted the first tribal summit on brain health and dementia, which was uh, tremendously exciting. But Tommy, let's go to your example. Next slide. Yeah, absolutely. So here in New Mexico, we have we have a couple examples. As you're seeing here, the New Mexico Department of Health developed a series of PSAs on the ways to reduce the risk of cognitive decline and promote cognitive health. Um, played on local TV stations, the purposely created so other health departments can utilize the same PSIs in their jurisdictions. But there's something here that I'm particularly proud of uh, coming out of the New Mexico chapter just a little more recently, is that our program director and one of our uh, program specialists from the Four Corners area, where there, uh, there, there are many uh, Navajo Nation members who, who are living in those, those communities, uh, we were able to uh, create a very strong partnership uh, with tribal leaders, with public health officials um, who are also members of the Navajo Nation to bring our programs, our education programs in the language of the Navajo Nation. And that, that language is Diné for many of you who don't know it. Um, and so through our, through our translator, uh, which was done so beautifully, uh, we were able to communicate uh, much of our program on overall awareness of the signs and symptoms, living with Alzheimer's, just a complete set of different topics related to Alzheimer's disease, dementia. And this information was presented uh, over radio um, by a radio station that is specific to the Navajo Nation. And again, it was done through a translator and it was done so well. And the participation certainly exceeded uh, you know, any expectation but moreover than that, Edie, is that this, this example um, really inspired us to continue our work because the reception was so warm 
and, and it was so appreciated that we did it in a way that was sensitive uh, to the culture and the language of the Navajo Nation. Um, and, and it certainly uh, is something that we look forward to doing and we continue to engage and use this as a great example as we interact with you know, many of the other tribal, uh, tribal governments here across the state to do something similar um, that respects their culture, respects their language, um, but does provide them with the resources that we are so happy to share. So that's one example that I think is, it is really done um, quite well, one we're very proud of, uh, and we look forward to bringing more successes uh, in a similar fashion in the years to come. So that's one I wanted to share as a very proud moment for our chapter. That's terrific. Um, so you can go to the next slide. I, so here's again, just pointing out um, where you can find the roadmap for Indian country. If you go to the CDC website or the Alzheimer's Association, um, simply look up the roadmap for Indian country. There are hard copies available. Um, and if you go to the next slide, um, you can certainly email myself uh, or Tommy, and we can get some out to you. Um, I know sometimes the hard copies are just nicer to have, so you have it readily available. Um, and as you heard from Tommy's uh, great example from New Mexico, ch 